submitted its uh, EIA to the uh, provincial government. You know, he's saying that there should be some resolution to this before the end of the year. Writ of Kalikasan, number three. This Writ of Kalikasan is, can be filed by anyone only if environment impacts affect two or more provinces. The uh, TEPOS, or the Temporary Environmental Protection Order, have been filed against mining companies in Surigao. Uh, Felix uh, Silangan Project, Manila Mining Kalayan Project, uh, Nickel Asia Taganitos Project, and Mac Ventures. We were informed that the resolution to the Silangan uh, Project will be lifted, or the TIEPO will be lifted before the end of the year. Item number four is the alternative mining bill. Several bills have been filed by the anti-mining groups and party list members. Mining resources found within these are those uh, ish, uh, the uh, uh, different uh, improvements, they say, regarding the uh, mining bill. Now they say that mineral resources found within ancestral domains areas belong to the IPs. All areas are close to mining unless declared open by the council composed of MGB, DNR, LGUs, IPs, and NGOs. Government shall receive 10% of gross revenues besides the exact stock of 2%. Removal of the FTAA. A position pa by paper by the chamber has been filed in Congress. We do not believe, though, that uh, uh, with all our contacts uh, within the uh, Congress, that this will materialize. There's the another bill that is of uh, concern is the land use bill. It only aims at limiting mineral areas and also place mineral resource development at the back burner of the country's development. Mineral development is not a priority sector under the bill. And priority is, is in declaring more protected areas and forest reservations to be close to mining. The uh, principal author of the bill resigned the other day. I don't know whether it's a good move or not. Increased taxation. Ec economic managers of the administration have been saying that the government has not been receiving its fair share in mining. And therefore, the DNR uh, drafted an executive order where mining areas will be declared as mineral reservations and with it a 5% royalty. The Office of the President referred back to the DNR, the position paper of the chamber on this matter. So we'll be discussing with the DNR uh, the, the uh, uh, conversion of mining areas to reservations, which I think will take a long time, or if at all. Number seven, use it or lose it policy, which was uh, implemented July, uh, October 2010 up to June 2011. The objective of this is to cleanse the pending uh, 2,200 mining applications in the MGB, which covers uh, 5 million hectares, which has not moved for an average of 10 years. So this is a good objective, uh, and it will satisfy serious mining investors who can no longer find open areas because of the many speculative mining applications that have blanketed the potential areas. With 97% acted upon already on these applications, it has resulted in a denial of 1,600 applications and 350 endorsed for approval. 24% of the denied claims are covered by motions for reconsideration. The chamber will be submitting a position paper by, as problems in implementation have cropped up. It will be uh, discussed with the DNR and MGB. One other item which uh, has always been hurled against the uh, mining is the lack of uh, uh, numbers, you say. We do not have the employment figures that will really swing the administration or anybody to be convinced that mining should be uh, entertained in this country. However, further is show, uh, our research show that the employment and number of people dependent on mining, metallic and non-metallic, sand and gravel, quarries, cement, and coal. We have uh, 340,000 uh, employees directly employed, and uh, with a multiplier of five, that's 1.7 uh, direct and indirect employees. And assuming a five per family, we're talking about 8.5 million Filipinos dependent on mining. With the new projects uh, in the next five to six years, another two million will be added to the 8.5 million having 10.5 million Filipinos dependent on mining. 
So that's a summary of the issues that has been uh, being discussed and our solutions to it. Thank you. Thank you very much, Art, uh, and of course, Jerry. I'm now introducing the question and answer time, so uh, we're now inviting questions from the floor. Uh, we'll devote about 10 minutes, if you don't mind. Um, we have roving microphones that are available. Uh, there are two lovely ladies, Joanna and Ray and Velarde, that have these mics. So please raise, can you, can you show who, who you are so they know to get the mic from? Okay. And uh, so in asking a question, uh, we'd appreciate it if you'd please stand and identify yourself and, and your affiliation. So who's ready to, uh, with a question? Okay, Jerry. What do you think, what do you think uh, when we leave this room we should be doing, given that we now understand, uh, you know, what, what, what's really going on in this, in this, uh, uh, this, this mudslinging fight between uh, the NGOs and the mining industry. Um, what, what, what we, we have here suppliers as well. No, we're not, we're just, just mining people. But what, 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 what's the best thing we could do uh, aside from just understanding what's going on? And that is that if you come under attack and you haven't been doing the right things, you are in deep trouble. This is a fact. It's actually quite easy for us in Rio Tuba and Coral Bay to defend ourselves because we are world class, we've been doing it, we've been operating at a very high standard for many years. And, um, and you've seen the, what I've had to show. But um, if, if we don't follow those standards in the industry, uh, year after year, there might be a few breaks, we will come under attack, there, there's no question. And uh, if we don't do the right things, it's going to be very hard for us to defend ourselves. So we really have to maintain and adopt very high standards in the, in the industry here to be able to survive these periodic attacks that will no doubt come. I mean, I've been doing this for 30 years and I don't know how many times I've had to go through this, so, yeah. Thanks, Leo. Uh, I was going to direct my question to Art, if you could help us with this. Uh, in recent times, uh, I've, I've uh, been uh, talking with shareholders and, and investors uh, from uh, places like New York and, and London and Hong Kong and many other places and, and the, one, the one issue that they keep raising with, with me about investing in the Philippines uh, is uh, these incidents of provinces that have, have stood up and taken their own, uh, the law into their own hands almost, uh, and, and they're being really called rogue provinces. And, and it's, the question is how can this happen from, from Western investors? They, they can't seem to understand how provinces can just openly defy what, what most believe to be national law. And, and it, is, it is truly a perplexing thing for these Western investors. And I was wondering, Art, if you could give us a view from, from not, not just the Chamber, but from a Filipino view, as how we can calm those Western investors who desperately want to invest, particularly in mining in the Philippines, but right now they have, have trouble doing so because of, of this, uh, uh, what appears to be defiance. Um, we have a study now which I said will be in time be provided to interested mining companies. And you will see the reason for these uh, anti-mining groups to be able to convince the provincial uh, government to put up their own environmental code. This is a consented effort. It's not just uh, the provincial uh, uh, government of uh, uh, South Cotabato. It's uh, everywhere who are against, are being agitated by uh, uh, mining groups. There is, a, there is a solution to that, of course. We'll, we'll never go into it frontally, but we can go through it in many other ways and uh, uh, get a resolution to the, uh, the impasse. And uh, this can be done by you know, having it uh, resolved by the Supreme Court, but uh, there are uh, companies who will say, no, that will take too long. Some will say, we'll rather do it uh, differently by uh, uh, going for a uh, surer process, working with the uh, provincial officials. And of course, getting the government to uh, come out and resolve this, which is uh, more important, national laws that will uh, prevail over environmental uh, uh, codes. There are many 
uh, ways how to handle it, but it takes time. So I'm sure that you have experienced it already, but uh, having this uh, EIA submitted already to the provincial board, which is what they want, and you can convince them regarding the uh, safety of their watersheds and water sources, I'm sure that, that uh, the thing will go away and you'll get your approval. Just to supplement perhaps what has been said by uh, Art, uh, if you recall some years ago we had the Mineral Development Council. Those of you who are here today could uh, do and support a move to revive it because um, I, uh, in my meetings with the foreign chambers, uh, they have been very uh, clear about their suggestion to try to have such a venue to dialogue between the investors, especially foreign investors, private sector, and government, because there's no point government do its own thing and private sector demanding something if there is no venue or facility where they can dialogue and, and arrive at something. Otherwise, both groups will be going around in circles and there's no convergence point. So I would like to reiterate uh, the uh, revival of the Mineral Development Minerals Council. Thank you, Ambassador. You know, under our laws, minerals belong to the state. Our constitution says, first, the government of the state has the right to develop these minerals or second, enter into contracts, okay? And these are the MPSAs, these are the FTAs. So therefore, since the government enters into the contracts, it's basically uh, an admission that while they have the minerals, they really don't have the, the capital or the technology to do it. So they ask a contractor to come in. So all miners are contractors of the government. Okay. They are not owners of the mines. The mines belong to the state. All mining projects belong to the state. The state, with its mining act, has invited the uh, contractors to, to come in and, and undertake the mining for the state. We all know that uh, ordinances that are passed by, by, by local governments cannot amend a national law. So the question is, when that happens, whose obligation is it to question the action of the local governments? The contractor or the owner of the mine, which is the state? And whose law, by the way, has been uh, challenged by, by a, a local government law? So uh, in my view, it's really the government that must take the action against the local governments to set those ordinances aside. The fact that the government has not lifted a finger to do it has allowed all of this to spread around the country. So I think it's all an issue of uh, the political will of government, which often is blunted by politics, to actually go forward and do it. Yeah, and so really, uh, it, it's like you're building a house, you as an owner of the property, and your contractor's being stopped by someone else. Is that the problem of the contractor? It's your property that's being interfered with, your property right to build a house. You should go after whoever is stopping you from doing it. So, uh, it's, it's, for me, it's a very simple thing, but I think it's, as Art says, it's quite complicated. Uh, it's a culture, it's whatever it is. But, uh,